intense economic crisis, there is always a shift to the right politically. That is, it's not inevitable. It could be a shift to the left. The China's desire to use technology and capital for strengthening socialism to meet people's aspirations and the uh, Western countries and global capitalism and imperialism wanting to use this opportunity to enter China to undermine socialism. Deng Xiaoping said, we'll open our windows. But remember, when you open your windows to the world, along with uh, good things, also mosquitoes and uh, uh, things will also enter. So your dengue, chicken, gunya, all will come inside <laughs> China, you'll open the door. So you'll have to combat them. One of the things that comes in with this is corruption. Now, corruption was a big issue that, uh, that they're combating and they continue to combat. Uh, you see, you see, one, the shift to the right that is happening in the capitalist world, you must understand there are various dimensions to it, but essentially, you must understand whenever there's an there's a intense economic crisis, there's always a shift to the right politically. That is, it's not inevitable. It could be a shift to the left. It all depends on the correlation of forces between who's stronger, left or right, who's able to exploit the discontent of the people because of the economic crisis, and who will gain as a result. Where the left is strong, the left gains. Where the left is not strong, the right gains. And, and that is the battle. Eventually, the battle is between the left and the right. And where, I mean, you have seen in the time of the Great Depression of the 1930s, one expression was the rightward shift in politics to the extent of fascism. That resulted, uh, you know, in, in Italy, in Germany, Hitler, etc. Everything was, was, was also a rightward shift as a result of the economic crisis. But that wherever you could stop that from happening, because of the left strength, it was stopped. Like it is today being stopped in many Latin American countries and many other areas. But in Europe, where the left is not relatively strong enough, the right is gaining. In this context, if you see, basically the point is, is not a political shift to the right, it is a battle between the left and the right. And in the battle, in some countries, is the left advancing, in some countries, in the right advancing. But more of the countries which matter in terms of the European, uh, you know, uh, uh, bigger countries, is the right that is shifting, therefore it's coming to the global attention. In that context, China's uh, party congress is very important. Because from the party congress, what have they said? It? Correctly, the Chinese have said that they are entering into a new, uh, new phase. Now, you look at it, this China, I think the, uh, I mean, all of us uh, should, in a nutshell, try and understand what the Chinese embarked in 1978, when the reform process. And uh, there was this, uh, the, the famous Chinese uh, leader, Deng Xiaoping. I remember 86, when I traveled, uh, with Comrade EMS, Deng Xiaoping already moved out of, uh, you know, public activity, but EMS, uh, Comrade EMS and he were old friends in the sense, both of them signed the joint communique re-establishing relations between the Communist Party of India and the Communist, India Marxist and the Communist Party of China. So when uh, EMS was there, was, we were on, on, what do you call, en route to, uh, we were going somewhere else, so we stopped there. So then Deng Xiaoping had a lunch, and then when I was there and trying to understand, like you asked me the question, what is this economic reforms, much younger, he asked uh, one of his comrades to bring a map of China. He told a map of China, and then he said, seven, it started in 78, this was 86, what we were talking about. He says, in 1980s, we will develop the south of China. 1990s, we'll go to the east of China, Shanghai. South of China is Guangzhou. Shenzhen, Shenzhen, now Hong Kong, you know, that, that, and then we'll go to Shanghai. And from 19, uh, uh, I mean, 2000 to 2010, to north of uh, China, where the British, uh, the British part of the British colony of China was there, that part. So 2010 to 2020, to western part of China, Chengdu, etc., which is now, you know, very well developed in there. And then 2020 to 2030, the central China. And then for the next 20 years, the whole of China will emerge to become the, the, the economic superpower of the world. That is the superiority of socialism.
Now you are talking today of 2017. So 2020 is is when you will start entering into into that overall development of Central China and the rest of China together. So it is a new phase for the Chinese. So what the Chinese General Secretary is saying is absolutely correct. That it is amazing that they have been able to stick to that plan. And they have been developing like that. So they are entering a new phase. That is, there is no doubt about it. But then this process has also set out a lot of problems. You know, you, you must understand, especially a bit in the younger generation, which I mean, we we also took time to understand that why did China actually begin these reforms? I mean, why it was a socialist country? It was all uh, appeared okay, but, but but why why did it start on these reforms in seventy eight? Because the Chinese Communist Party came to a conclusion, and I think correctly, that the major contradiction in China, in the Chinese society is between the rising aspirations of the people and these aspirations are rising because of socialism. Socialism gave them the, the, those aspirations. The, the people's rising aspirations and the inability of the economic and the uh, social structure to meet those aspirations. Now, if this contradiction is not resolved, China, socialism in China can implode. It will implode. If people's uh, aspirations are not fulfilled, naturally socialism cannot be sustained. So they said reforms are required to resolve this contradiction. So reforms means what? You allowed Western capital, Western technology to come and sign. Your objective or their objective it was to strengthen socialism using that. But I mean, capitalism's capital and capitalism's technology is not going to come into China to strengthen socialism. It will come into China to destroy socialism. That is obviously the capitalism and socialism this thing. So that was the inherent contradiction. The reform process itself began with this inherent contradiction. The China's desire to use technology and capital for strengthening socialism to meet people's aspirations and the uh, Western countries and global capitalism and imperialism wanting to use this opportunity to enter China to undermine socialism. So the conflict or contradiction between imperialism and socialism was inherent in this process of reforms. Now, in this process, what is correctly said by Xi Jinping now, Xi Jinping now, and what was said by Hu Jintao earlier, or their earlier leaders, is that you had three different types of problems that emerged. One was an imbalanced development. This imbalance was economic inequalities between people growing, economic inequalities between regions growing. See, now both these are antithetical to socialism. They had to be met consciously to be overcome. The second area of uh, problem was that of, because of this reform process and like Deng Xiaoping said, we'll open our windows. But remember, when you open your windows to the world, along with uh, good things, also mosquitoes and uh, uh, things will also enter. So your dengue, chicken, gunya, all will come inside <laughs> China, you'll open the door. So you'll have to combat them. One of the things that comes in with this is corruption. Now, corruption was a big issue that, uh, that they're combating and they continue to combat. So social inequalities, regional inequalities, and corruption. These were the three major issues that the Communist Party itself identified. Now, they have need to resolve this. So the inherent point is what we understand is that the Chinese Communist Party is using the reforms to try and strengthen socialism in China, while imperialism is using this opportunity to try and undermine socialism. So now who will win? So far, Socialist China is winning, and even in this Congress, Xi Jinping has said very clearly they adhere to the Marxist-Leninist, Mao Zedong thought, Deng Xiaoping theory, Jiang Zemin tree, etc., etc., and he talked of the question of the four cardinal principles as being essential and of socialism in Chinese characteristics. So far in this battle, that is there, but the battle is not ended. So as an Indian communist or a communist outside China, what do I say? I'm not going to predict who will win or not. Marxism is not astrology. 
I as a communist, what I say is, in this struggle that is there, I stand by those who want to strengthen socialism in China. And that is what we think that uh, Xi Jinping and the others and this party Congress is trying to do. So that's why we wish them well. We wish them well for the next five years to strengthen this process.